28, 19, and 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. This is the word of the Lord. All right, you guys have a seat. Thank you. Uh, that was Jeremy um, and Sarah Skiles. They have uh, recently also joined the church uh, just a couple of weeks ago. And man, we just have continually so many people coming in and uh, not, you know, sitting for a little bit and then eventually seeing, man, I want to be a part of what uh, God is doing here at, uh, at Life Point Creek. So, man, great new family. Uh, introduce yourself to them if you haven't already. And, uh, man, let's dive in. Open up to that passage. Matthew 28 um, is our kind of our anchor that we'll be jumping off here today. I'll get there with you here. In the 1940s, the United States Navy began construction on a project to build a massive ship called the U.S. United States. Uh, this project would cost an estimated $80 million. And this ship was going to be the most expensive, largest, fastest, safest ship in the world. But this ship was created to be a transport uh, that, would, that would deliver 10,000 troops uh, to go to battle in World War II. But after it set sail, set sail in 1952, um, it, it never actually was used for its intended purpose. Uh, soon after it set sail, it, it made history as a luxury liner that catered to wealthy patriots. It was, a, it was a luxury, kind of a tourist attraction kind of type thing that it turned into. Um, it was eventually docked on the Delaware River where today it sits. It sits as a tourist attraction rotting away, and it's basically useless for the task that it was created for. Church, we, we, are, in, uh, we are in a war. Um, we're in a world war. And we need to remember, of course, that the war has ultimately already been won, right? We need to remember that. But we also need to remember that Jesus said, um, I think in Matthew and Mark, that there would be times of little W wars, rumors of wars. And every time that we turn on the news or we swipe on our devices, we are reminded of the wars that we are in. War over truth, what is right, what is wrong, war over politics, war over pronouns, war over race, war over the roles of men and women. We're just constantly reminded of the wars that we're in. We're warring for the minds and the hearts of our children and our children's children. Of course, we know that this is all spiritual warfare, right? We know that. But Matthew 28, 19 through 20, the great commission of Jesus reminds us that the church is not a luxury liner. It is a troop carrier. It is designed and created to move the Christian troops into the battle. And when we refuse to engage in that mission and we kind of sit into the comfort of a cocoon-like Christianity or Amish avoidist, if we refuse to engage in the mission and we just sit there and this Church will be this come and see attraction that people just come to. You know what's going to happen if we take that approach. Eventually what we're going to turn into is a tourist attraction. And we too will eventually rot away and become useless for the task that we were created for. 
I don't want that to be us. Matthew 28 reminds all of us that the last command of Jesus is the first priority of the church. The last command of Jesus is also the first priority of every Christian. And we're going to talk about that today because we're in our last week of our series, Fine Life, where we've been kind of talking through our mission statement and mantra. We've talked about the importance of gathering and growing and giving. And today, we're obviously going to talk about going, about going. You know, pastors usually eval the health and success of their churches by numerics of how many people are coming. Well, we have this many. We have thousands. We've got three thousands. God doesn't measure church's health by how many people are coming. Measures health by how many people are going. How many people are going and making disciples of all nations, fulfilling the Great Commission In today's passage, in context here, Matthew 28, this is after the resurrection of Christ. This is just right before his ascension, and he gathers his disciples, his soldiers, and he gives them their marching orders. He gives us our marching orders. Orders. After he makes a lofty claim of all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, he gives us his last command, go and make disciples. Now, notice what he didn't say. This is a, I mean, this is a big moment, right? He said a lot of things. I mean, he has been preaching and teaching for three years. He said countless things. But here in context, he's saying last thing, most important thing that Jesus is going to say here as we dial in and are attentive as I'm surely that they were. Notice what he didn't say though. He didn't say, hey, go and make war against all of our enemies. He didn't say, hey, go kill the people that just killed me. Let's get revenge right here. He didn't say, hey, go and make really good posts on social media about your beliefs. And and if someone disagrees, then of course blast them. He didn't say to go do that. He didn't say go into the world and be religious referees, throwing flags at every act of unrighteousness. He didn't even say here, go to church. He didn't say go to Bible study. Go feed the poor, go gather, go grow, go give. He didn't say those things. Those aren't bad things, of course, right? They're not bad things. But they are not superior things. And they are not a substitute for the Great Commission to go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. This is the most important thing that Jesus said in his last words. Again, the last command of Jesus should be the first priority of the church and the Christian. I'm passionate about a lot of things right now. Uh, In my walk with the Lord and as I understand Christianity and I grow in my sanctification, I'm passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about things like Reformed theology. I'm passionate about uh, soteriology, studying how salvation works. I'm passionate about the doctrines of grace. I'm passionate about studying the culture, anthropology, just the dynamics of what's happening in the world, why are the way that we are, cultural things that are happening. I'm passionate about fighting against woke agenda. I'm passionate about fighting against far, far right legalists. I'm I'm passionate about a lot of things. I'm passionate about the doctrines of the church, church membership. I think it's very important. I think it's very important to be in fellowship. I think it's very important to gather. I think it's very important to grow. I think it's very important to give. I'm passionate about a lot of things. And then when I read this, I'm reminded that the last command of Jesus is the first priority of the church. 
I also think that this go therefore make disciples is God's primary means of growing his church. Not postcards, not building awesome buildings. Hey, let's just, let's Disneyfy the church. Then people come here, we'll just grow. Not that, not, not programs. I don't think programs are the way to build the church. I think that's not the primary way. I also don't think the primary way to grow a church is by uh, saint stealing and sheep swapping, where you have people just bouncing around, transferring growth and all this stuff. Listen, some of you guys, y'all have moved here from different cities and states, and I'm not saying that's a bad thing, right? Some of you are here because of the exodus from California and those kind of things. That's awesome. That's cool. But those aren't bad things, and sometimes we move. But I believe that the primary ways that God's church grows is by us just making disciples. This is, this is it. A guy named Mike Breen said this, and I love this. So I've hung on to this one for a long time, said it before. If you make church, you will rarely get disciples. But if you make disciples, you will always get the church. That's good. Right, that's good. Write, write that one down. And so it, it, when I read that, I'm like, okay, RC, your job is really not to make church happen. Your programs, events, make sure everybody gets to this event, make sure everybody comes to this breakfast, make sure everybody goes to this. That's making church. I'm reminded and I'm focused on the last command of Jesus. My job, our job is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. What does that look like? What does it look like to make disciples? Well, thankfully, uh, Jesus here gives us three active things to do that, that making disciples, it is. It's going, it's baptizing, and it's teaching, right? That's what he says there in Matthew 28. The first thing that we do in our making of disciples is we go. The going is going into the world and proclaiming the good news of the gospel, the, the crucified Christ and what he did by living and dying and being resurrected, that's the good news of the gospel. That's the first step in going is going with the gospel. Look at Mark 16, 15. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. So our first act in going is going with the gospel. We get the gospel right, and we get the gospel out. That's very important. If you don't get the gospel right, it doesn't need to go out. So you got to get the gospel right, and then you got to get the gospel out. That's the first thing that we do. How will people be raised from the dead if they don't hear the good news of the gospel? How will they ever believe if they don't hear the gospel? How will they ever act like Christians if they don't hear the gospel, right? That's what Paul said. How will they call on him if they've not believed? And how will they hear if someone does not go and tell them? It's the first thing we do is we go with the gospel in words, by the way, church. We, we want to show the gospel with our lives, of course, but it's not our lives that wake people from the dead and give them life. It is only the message, the power is in the message of the life, death, and resurrection of Christ. The second thing we do in our making disciples is by marking disciples through baptism. Once someone does believe, post-salvation, post-rebirth, we mark a disciple by immersing them in water. That's underneath the water, not a sprinkling of water, but, a, but an immersion into the water showing the fullness of the old person dying and being raised to new life in Christ. And we do that, of course, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The third thing we do here is we teach. We teach is what he says here. Making disciples is teaching. It's Teaching other people, making disciples, maturing other believers by teaching them all 
of the commands of Jesus, to obey all of the commands of Jesus. We do that at our church uh, through a lot of D groups. That's what we call D groups. It's D is discipleship. We encourage a lot of people to get into D groups. Why? Because we have people in there teaching the other people how to mature in Christ and to observe all of Jesus' commands. For those who lead those groups, thank you all for what you do. I remind you again, you are actively participating in the Great Commission. The Great Commission. So these three things, go make disciples of all nations, baptizing and teaching. This is the mission. These are the marching orders of the church. It's individual. It is biological, but it's also communal. It's, it's me, it's you, it's all of us. Again, the last command of Jesus is the first priority of the church. I think it's really what the, the Bible, if I had to summarize the Bible in, in, in one, one way, one passage, it's by Psalm 46.10. So flip over with me or flip back to Psalm 46, 10. If God has saved you, he has saved you to send you. And when you know God, you make God known. That's the whole Bible, by the way. Know God, make him known. That's what Psalm 46.10 is all about. Look at, we'll read this together. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. Now, in that passage, I think most people are probably familiar with the first half of it, right? Be still and know that I'm God. You lo- we love that, right? That's coffee cup, sitting on a beach, toes in the sand, be still, oh yeah, right? We all know that one. But very few Christians can recite or even explain part B, that God will be exalted in the nations, that God will be exalted on the earth. So we're going to talk about, for the remainder of our time, those two ideas about knowing God and making God known. First thing I want us to see here, and this is just be still and know. These are the words of God as he actually breaks into the psalm. The psalm is being written as the psalmist is writing the psalm, but then all of a sudden in Psalm 4610, God breaks in the middle of the psalm. He says, be still Know that I am God. Context of this psalm is hugely important. Um, The context here is Jerusalem is surrounded on all sides by enemies of God that were threatening their very existence as a people. The psalm describes the earth is shaking Mountains are moving, there's chaos, there's kingdoms that are raging and and tottering and roaring and raging. There's all of this chaos surrounding here. And in the midst of that kind of chaos, when the earth was feeling like it was crumbling beneath them in every way, God does an amazing work in that psalm. He, He burned the chariots and he broke the bows, the bows and the spears And he brought decisive victory to his people. That's what he did in the entire Psalm of 46. But then he gave the sons of Korah this psalm, this promise, in the midst of this, to challenge Israel. Be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that he is God. This is a great word for us. When I read the context of Psalm 46 and I see what was surrounding Jerusalem, I see this very much like the world that we live in today, don't you? Enemies all around us, people who oppose the Christian faith, oppose the church, 
feeling potentially the threat of non-existence of Christianity. Earth is shaking, kingdoms are tottering, warring, raging, all of these things. I'm very dialed into Psalm 46. I hope that you are as well. Even the Bible Belt, we are still gasping for Christendom. We, we want to live in Christian cities, but the reality is we live in Sodom and Gomorrah. Church seems to be losing ground. Influence, you got, a, you got moral failure stories coming out all the time. You got people in, the, in their own faith, Christians attacking one another while the world just watches this crumble and fight and all this disunity. You see, you see churches that are caving to culture, abandoning orthodox Christianity that they've stood on for 2,000 years. It looks like ground is shaking underneath the church, and I don't know if it's going to survive. But the God of Psalm 4610 breaks into all of that chaos, and he says, be still and know that I'm God. Be still and know that I'm God. We, we, we read that again. We, we hear that verse and we think, okay, God's just kind of saying, uh, chill out, sit on the beach, drink your coffee, and all of those things. That's not a bad thing to do. But that's actually not what he's saying here when he says, be still and know that I'm God. The Hebrew word that he's describing here when he says, be still, is the word Rafa or Rafa, and it just simply, it, it means this, to cease striving, cease panic, cease worrying, cease this crazy chaos, freak out mentality. That's what he's saying to his people. He's not telling them to stop and do nothing. He's not even telling them to be silent. He's saying, Stop all of your frantic, crazy, running around stuff. Be still and know that I am God. That's what he's saying in the middle of this. In our times of trouble right now, God is not telling us to stop activity. He's not, he's, he's not saying disengage the war, disengage and just sit back and let go of that God. That's not what he's saying. And he's not telling us to be quiet either. But what he is saying is, stop all of the chaos, the frantic mindset, the panic, the, the crazy Facebook post, the crazy arguing with people on the other side, the worrying about the future of the world, what is going to happen to it. He says to us, be still and know that I am God. In other words, stop acting like I'm dead. Martin Luther, great reformer Martin Luther, back when the Black Plague had swept through Germany, Luther, who battled depression, um, he was really struggling one day specifically uh, with that depression, and his wife Catherine uh, approached him when he came down for breakfast one morning, and he was eating his breakfast. Catherine walks in, and she's dressed in all black. And Martin Luther said to his wife, "He says, why do you look like you're going to a funeral?" He said, "Who died?" She responded by telling him, "Well, apparently God did by the way that you're acting." When we look at the world and we, we're in panic and fear and worry and anxiety, not only about the things in our own personal world, but in the world, we're acting like God is dead. He's not dead. He is alive, ruling, reigning on the throne today. Regardless of the breaking news of the day, he's still in sovereign control. He is omnipotent. He is all-knowing. 
He is everywhere. He's kindly, lovingly ruling, reigning over all things again. He's trustworthy. He's working everything out in this world according to his plan and our good. There is no panic in heaven. There is only plans in heaven. So in the midst of that, God speaks to us like a loving father who simply just kind of gives us this soft rebuke and says, be still, look up, calm down, I reign. I reign. But I think that the the impact of that statement, I don't really think we can be still and know God until we put down the devices. I don't think we can be still and know God until we turn off the phones, until we turn off the TV and we sit alone with God, read the words of God and be reminded of why we can be still and know that he's God. Those incredible realities won't happen with busyness and scurrying around and not having time for quiet time through the week and I gotta do this, I gotta do that. You won't, you won't experience the stillness of God until we stop and we are still before God. I think his statement of being still and know that he's God, he's reminding all of us, both the believer And the unbeliever that the most important knowledge that anyone could ever have on this planet is the knowledge of God. I don't know what degree you're pursuing. I don't know what degree you have. I don't even know what continued education and knowledge you're seeking in your life. But it ain't more important than the knowledge of God. There's a lot of people in heaven who are not smart at all. And they don't have knowledge of anything else failed every grade they had, but they're sitting in glory today because why? They have the knowledge of God. (laughs) They know God. And this is the most important knowledge that we have. That means that the most dangerous thing in the world is really not in the world. The most dangerous thing in the world that we face is not cancer, it's not a virus, it's not violence, it's not gangs. The greatest danger in this world is not knowing the God of Psalm 46. The God of Psalm 46.10, he came to us. He came in the person of Jesus Christ, invisible God made visible. The God of Psalm 46.10 lived a life we can't live died the death that we deserve, was resurrected on the third day. Why did he do all of that? So that you and I could know God. So that we could be still and know God. And I don't mean know about God, and I don't mean know the stories of God. I mean knowing God personally, personally, intimately, salvifically. That is our greatest need, is to know God. Do you know God today? And I don't mean, again, about the concept of God. I don't mean the stories of God. I don't even mean the existence of God. I'm talking about do you know God personally, intimately, lovingly as the father that he is? Do you know him like that? This is why you were created. This is the only way you will ever experience true abundant life on earth is by knowing God. And if you want to know God, you have to go to Jesus first. We'll talk to you about that today. If you want to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ, we'd love to do that with you. People that know God, they have heard that gospel. They understand the God of Psalm 46. People who know God, the next natural response of people who know God is to go and make God known. What's the rest of it? The second piece of this psalm here. It's not only be still and know God, but now it is to go and make God known. 
Knowing God is not just for our personal benefit. Knowing God is not just for our benefit so that we would get our get out of hell free card from Jesus. Not so we could just go to church and, um, and, and become spiritual shut-ins from the rest of the world and we just take, as long as we take our kids with us and all, that's not why God has made us with the ability to know him. By the way, he's done that. God made you know him. And so you thank God for it. And the natural outpouring is to go make him known. To go make him known all over the world. To all nations, by the way. Not just to this specific race of people or these people that are like me, but to all nations to make God known. People who know God they understand that we have a going God, right? How, how God sitting in the heavenly places, how he, he, he went, he, he got up, he went to the earth, right? The gospel that we've just shared here and that we too who've experienced the going of God is we mimic our God by going and doing what he did, by going to tell people the good news of Jesus where they may find life in Christ. Sadly, though, statistics among American Christians, you know, statistics, tomato, tomato, you don't know how valid they are, but, but they're generally accurate. American Christians, by statistics, only 5% of American Christians actually share their faith and go make God known to other people. To them... The Great Commission is more like the Great Omission. You know, it used to be where America sent out missionaries to the world. Well, if we continue to go down this pace right here, other countries are going to be sending missionaries to America because we're so dang lost. We have to remember, again, the last command of Christ is the first priority of the church. God has made himself known to us so that we may go and make him known. Look at Acts 1.8 with me. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. The Gospel of John records this in 2021, it's our live sent passage as a church. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. So if you are a saved one, you are a sent one. If God has saved you and made himself known to you, he now commissions you, all people, to go be missionaries into the world. Now, some he sends to other cultures to get their passport stamped and learn new languages by studying Rosetta Stone. Some, he sends some people to go do that, right? But most of us, that's not the case. Most of us, he's sending into our homes, our neighborhoods, our ballparks, our schools, and our places of work to go and make him known in those places. Places. Look at Luke 8 39. This is, by the way, this is Jesus after he has healed the demon possessed man. This is what he tells him. He says, Return to your home. Declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. It's a little like the woman at the well, but. This, this tells us a little bit more application on how to do this. It tells us that going and making disciples begins in the home, doesn't it? Go to your home is what he says. Tell everybody in your house, declare how much God has done for you. It starts in the home. It starts by us going. This, and again, this, this man, this demon-possessed man who's just been delivered by exorcism by Jesus, he says, he's got no theological precision. He's got no, he doesn't know dispensationalism and reformed theology. He just knows what Jesus did for him. And he's just, Jesus said, hey, just go tell everybody what I did. Start in your home. 
Go home and tell everybody in your home about me and what I've done for you. That's where you start. Church, you start in your home by telling your your children. Don't, Don't wait till the pastor does it on Sunday. You do that at home. It's more important than teaching them how to hit a ball and how to score a touchdown and how to get really good grades. Tell them at home about what Christ has done for you. But it doesn't stop at home, does it? Making disciples is not just a biological one. It is a biological one, but it's not just biological. Faithfulness in that one area is very important, but it is not an excuse to forsake the other ones. We, we also go into the city, is what this man did. He says, go into the city proclaiming all of Jesus. When, when we go out into the city, we're supposed to tell the people that we come in contact with everything that Jesus has done. That's what it says right here. It says we're supposed to go into our places of work. In the city, tell them about Jesus. We're supposed to go to the ballparks, redeem the ballpark, and tell people about Jesus. Go to your barber, your hairdresser, tell them about Jesus. Make God known. In all of these domains, we are to make God known. You know, I've said this a while back, but I think about the Christian today and we all so much, we, we, we love the, the idea of having a Christian world, city, school, workplaces. We love that idea, that utopia. I just wish everything was Christian and everyone believed as we believed. I think that's a good, good thing to have. I think we all should want that. God's kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. We, we should want that. Well, if you want that, and I want that, I think we have to remember that if you want a Christian country, you have to start with your kid. If you want a Christian city, start with the citizen. If you want a Christian nation, start with your neighbor. And if you want a Christian company to work for, start with your coworker. Just tell them about Jesus. This is the plan. This is how we are used in the Great Commission. I think there was a time where the church was in a season where we were receivers. Hey, just be a great place of a welcoming all the people. Just come on in here. We'll welcome you. Come as you are. I think the days are moving to a place where we don't need to be receivers. We need to be rescuers. We have to go out and win people as spiritual first responders to dying people. Dying people. Dying children, dying teens, dying adults. We are the spiritual first responders to the world. And I think this, there's a confidence in here, by the way. We'll close this out. I think there's a confidence in our going. When we go, <clears throat> the responsibility is ours, but the results are not. Notice it says here, In Psalm 46.10, that God will be exalted among the nations in all of the earth. See, that's the end of the story. The very end of the story, God will be exalted on the earth among all nations and all people. That's how it all ends. And so... That gives me great confidence in my going that responsibility is mine, but the results are the Lord. He will will inherit all nations to his glory and for our good. We are to go and make him known. Let's respond today to the word. Um, I'm going to ask a couple of reflective questions. And as I ask the questions, um, we're going to give this space to reflect and respond personally where you sit. But here's the, here's the questions that I want to you to reflect on today. Number one, do you know God? Not about the things of God, 
belief in God, the concept of God? Do you know about church and the stories? I don't mean that. I mean, do you know the God of the Bible in a personal, salvific way? If you don't and you want to know your maker and your creator, where life is truly found, today give your life to Christ and you will know the God of the Bible. The second question I would ask is, if you do know God, are you making him known to the people in your life? Are you involved participating Obeying the Great Commission? Are you going and sharing the gospel with anyone? Are you having conversations with people in your life beyond the shallow, how are you doings? Oh, tell me about your life. Are you getting, are you building bridges and getting, find out ways to have conversations that get to Jesus? If people need life, they need to hear the gospel, and that's where we come in. The last command of Jesus is the first priority of the Christian. The second question I would ask is, have you seen anybody personally baptized because of your investment into them? Because you shared the gospel with them? Because you have been teaching them to observe all of the commands. Have you ever watched that and participated and said, oh, thank you, God, for using me in the baptism waters and seeing new life come to Christ? It's a part of the Great Commission. And the last part of that is, are you teaching anyone about Christ? Anyone. Home, Church, co-worker, neighbor, are you teaching anyone about Christ and his commands? I'm going to give you some time to respond to that internally. And I'm going to pray. And then out of that, I'm going to give some very practical things to help you do those things today. So, And right now, the band's going to come up. And uh, we just want to give you a moment. Would you just bow your heads and, and, man, just meditate on the Lord and what he'd be doing, and then I'll close us out in just a moment.
Father, in response today to your word and in response to you sending your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to give us life, to make a way for us to know you. God, we want to be like you. So I pray that it is the individual and corporate response of our church today to say, God, here we are, send us. Remind us that we're not going alone. Remind us of the promise that you will be with us to the end of the age. Before us, behind us, beside us, all around us. Equipping and empowering us for the call to go. God, I pray that the city of Smyrna, Murfreesboro, Laverne, all of Rutherford County would know you as Lord and Savior. And I pray that you would use us to do it. In Christ's name, amen.